Right, so in a, in a quaternion algebra of class number one, there are L plus one. There's fewer if you have a class number. Are we ready? OK, so um, let me just remind you where we were yesterday. Uh, all the talks seem to circle around the same collection of ideas. So I thought I would start with this slide. Um, we were in the middle of this discussion of this duality uh, between functions on the boundary of the piatic upper half plane, these locally analytic functions, and the rigid analytic functions on the interior of the piatic upper half plane, or on the uh, piatic upper half plane itself. This is what I was calling Morita duality. And you remember that we had various ways of going back and forth, this integral transform and the residue map. And in the course of this discussion, uh, these harmonic functions on the tree uh, came up, basically by the residue map. If you had a, a rigid analytic function on the upper half plane, you could, for each annulus, you could compute this number called the residue. And because of this piatic residue theorem, the resulting function was harmonic on the tree. And um, the interesting thing here is that I am talking about piatic valued functions on the tree, and Matt was talking about real valued functions on the tree. And, um, but other than that, there's a lot, <laughs> so a lot of things are kind of similar. So this was the definition of what is a, an m-valued harmonic cocycle on the tree. It's a function on the edges which changes sign when you reverse the edge and whose sum over the uh, adjacent vertices counted with orientation is zero. And what is the relevance of this? Well, we looked a little bit at this picture, so let me just remind you about what's going on here. So O of k, this is the entire functions on the upper half plane with a group action that corresponds to the even integer, p positive even integer k. P k minus 2, this is the finite dimensional space of polynomials of degree k minus 2, which has a certain group action because it sits inside another one of these spaces. These are the harmonic functions with values in this finite dimensional vector space. On the right hand side, this complicated space here was the space of functions on the boundary, the locally analytic functions on the boundary, again keeping track of the group action. And what I've done is taken the continuous dual of that with the strong topology. So this upper arrow, this upper isomorphism is the kind of basic duality isomorphism that identifies rigid functions with distributions on the boundary. Inside the analytic functions, we had the locally polynomial functions. In the case k equals 2, these are just the analytic functions, modulo constants, and these are the locally constant functions, modulo constants. And if you have a linear form on this space, you can restrict it to the subspace. That's what the vertical map is. It's restriction of continuous linear functionals to the subspace. And this map is the residue map. If I have a function, I can compute its residues basically in this way. I take the function and an annulus corresponding to an edge, and I need to evaluate that on a polynomial. So I just multiply the function times the polynomial and times dz and take the residue. And more generally, if I have a locally polynomial function, so I have a collection of polynomials on different open sets, each of which is parameterized by an edge of the tree, I extend this by linearity. I sum up this thing. And this, is, this lower arrow here is sort of, I, you can also call it the residue map. And here's a picture. So we have some edges up here, right? And they, you look on the edge out at the ends, and you see some open sets. And on those open sets, I have given you some polynomial functions. They're not related to one another. They're just different polynomial functions in this variable x. And I kind of want to integrate that locally polynomial function against this function on the edges. And so I. I do this, the dot product, if you like. I, I apply, the value on this edge is a, is a linear functional on polynomials, and I just apply it to that polynomial, and I take the one for this edge, and I apply it to this polynomial, and I take the one for that edge, and I apply it to this polynomial, and I add them up. And locally polynomial function means somehow that if I go far enough out in the tree, I can find small enough open sets in the boundary so that my function is actually given by an honest polynomial on each one of those open sets in the boundary. So this is the integration of locally polynomial functions. Whoops. And just to put the whole picture together, this is the, uh, the relationship between the, the Morita duality and the um, Duram cohomology. So we have two exact sequences here. Let's start on this side. On this side, we have the 
boundary functions. These are these uh, locally analytic functions with poles at infinity and sign of group action modulo polynomials. You can take their k minus first derivative and you get just a general locally analytic function. The k keeps track of what happens with the group action. It's nice to think about k equals 2. These are then locally analytic functions. These are then sort of locally analytic one forms. And the kernel are these locally algebraic functions. So for k equals 2, those would be the locally constant functions. So this is kind of like the Duram sequence for locally analytic functions on the boundary, which is a, in some ways a, it's interesting because the, the H1 part is trivial. It's, you can always integrate back. But the H0 part is big because when you take a function whose derivative is 0, you get a locally constant function. So there's lots of H0 and not very much H1. Whereas on the other side, you have the rigid analytic functions on the upper half plane with this group action. And you can take the residue of such a function and get one of these harmonic functions on the tree with values in um, these linear forms on polynomials. And if you think about it a minute, you remember what the residue is. It's the coefficient of dz over z. So what is the kernel of the residue map? Well, in the way two case, you're just taking your function, restricting it to an annulus, and if you have zero residue, it means there's no dz, no dz over z term. So you can integrate that formally, right? The, the obstruction to integrating a power series, a Laurent series, is you don't want any residue. So formally speaking, if you have no residues at all, you should be able to integrate, at least sort of locally, on the annuli. And if you have, I mean, this, if you have higher weight, you've taken the residue of powers of z times your function. And what that means is you don't only have, you have not only have no dz over z term, but let's say also no dz over z squared term and no dz over z cubed term. So you could integrate several times and not produce a dz over z term. And it turns out, although this is, I mean, this is a, what I said is a long way from a proof of this fact. It turns out that the kernel of the residue map are the exact forms. So the Duram cohomology, if, if you plug in k equals 2, you're looking at the actual Duram cohomology of the upper half plane, is identified with this space of harmonic functions on the tree. So that's a theorem originally um, maybe due to Morita. And it fits with my tubular neighborhood picture, right? The Duram cohomology is the harmonic functions on the tree. And then if you have higher, if you put in the k, you get these sort of vector-valued harmonic functions on the tree. And this, these pair up, right? So that's the, what's supposed to be indicated here, that the, the exact forms are the annihilator of the locally polynomial functions in the duality. Okay? And the, uh, sorry, yeah. And so therefore, the Duram cohomology, which is this space of harmonic functions, is actually the true dual of the locally algebraic functions. And from the topological point of view, I'll just mention that the topology on this space is what's called, I mean, it's the finest locally convex topology. It's just the direct limit topology. So any continuous linear form on it is automatic. Any, any linear form is automatically continuous in that topology. And this is the full dual. This is just all linear functionals on that space. OK, so that somehow is the story, the analytic story. And I, I wanted to make. Is my sound OK? Yeah. Well, then it's going to be too close to my neck. All right. Well, we'll see what happens here. Um, I'm not, it's the wrong wardrobe, you see. I apologize for that. Now, there's no real solution to this, I think. But. Be sure to get all this on video. This is probably no good either, but what the heck. OK, so um, now I want to sort of add one more refinement to this picture, which is to introduce the notion of bounded distribution. So what does boundedness mean? Well, it's easy in some cases. If, if you're, um, let's take the k equals 2 situation. So then your, your um, residue map, which gives you this harmonic function on the tree, it's just a constant, fun constant valued function on the tree. And bounded just means piadically bounded. Okay? So in other words, the residues, these numbers that you get out of your differential forms, are just bounded piadically. More generally, if you take values in this representation space, bounded means 
that when you pick the value of your residue, so I mean, what you have is then a, a linear form on this space of polynomials. And you fix a norm that's sort of associated with the basic edge. And something is bounded if when you apply the group to pull it back to the basic edge, it's bounded as a linear functional in that norm. In practice, what this means is that bounded for higher weight means there's controlled growth as you go out towards the boundary on the tree. So they're not literally bounded, but you have control over the growth of these uh, linear forms. And they, if you take the space of harmonic functions which are bounded, then you have a supnorm on them and you get a Banach space. So the C har K B means the linear functionals or the harmonic functions on the tree which are bounded in this sense. And it's good, I think this should say when k equals 2. When k equals 2, the space of bounded harmonic functions, these are just literally p-adically bounded functions. That's a good example to think about. If you've done p-adic integration before, then you should think about the difference between distributions on zp and measures on zp. Distributions on zp are sort of arbitrary finitely additive functions, and measures are bounded ones. So the, the harmonic cocycles which are bounded are like the measures. And the reason they're significant is, let's take k equals 2 for simplicity. Remember that the locally analytic functions are, the locally algebraic functions are just the smooth functions, the locally constant ones. If you have a bounded harmonic cocycle, well, it gives you an element of the dual of this space, but now that element of that dual is bounded for the soup norm. And you can then extend that linear functional to the completion of this space in its soup norm. And the completion of this space in its soup norm is the continuous functions. So now what this is saying is that if you happen to have a bounded linear functional, a bounded residue, then you get not just a linear form on the locally constant functions, but on the continuous functions. And this, again, is what happens in normal p-adic integration. You start with a, a distribution. You can integrate locally constant functions against it. If it's bounded, you can extend to the continuous functions. So the bounded harmonic functions are actually, they turn out to be, um, in some sense, the, I mean, you have to say what the topology is. But they're, they're the dual of the Banach space of continuous functions on P1. It's more complicated to say exactly what happens in the higher weight case, and so I'm not going to try. But there is some completion of the low, of the, in the higher weight case, too. And what I'll just remark is that in the, this function, 1 over z minus x, is a continuous function of x for fixed z. And therefore, when you have a bounded distribution, you can actually integrate 1 over z minus x against that bounded distribution. And when you do that, so now here you're using just the continuity of this thing. And you took your f, and you're only using its residues. So you've somehow forgotten a lot of the information about f. But nevertheless, you can integrate back to get a rigid function, which will be well defined, and will have this, the residue that you started with, the harmonic function that you started with, as its residue. So what this is saying is that you started with a harmonic function on the tree that was bounded, and you integrated it against 1 over z minus x, and you got a rigid analytic function, which, if you then took the residues of it, would go back and give you the thing that you started with. So the space O of 2b, which are the images of this map, turn out to be the, exactly the space of functions with bounded residues. And if you interpret this in terms of Dirac cohomology, sorry, I don't want that you can remember that the, the harmonic functions on the tree are the Dram cohomology of the piatic upper half space. And this says that if you have a bounded harmonic function, you can actually recover the one form. So you get a, and this is, turns out to be G equivariant. So there's a canonical one form representing that cohomology class. So it's a kind of a Hodge theory type result, but only for bounded harmonic cosines. And there's a more a similar but more complicated construction in higher weight. This is, I think I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. OK. So um, a lot of this theory was developed with a particular application in mind. I mean, the, the whole 
notion of piatic uniformization and, and really the, the piatic upper half plane that we've been talking about is originally due to Mumford, whose interest was in generalizing the tate elliptic curve. And what Mumford actually proved is something like this. This is rather vaguely stated. Um, you can find discrete subgroups of GL2 of QP, for example. And if you take the quotient of the piatic upper half plane by the action of these discrete groups, what you get is an algebraic curve. And the, the idea behind this is that you construct modular forms for this discrete group gamma on x, and you can construct enough of them to get a projective embedding of the quotient. And that projective embedding will then be closed, and you can then apply the machinery of rigid analysis to prove that it's actually algebraic. And in the opposite direction, if you have an algebraic curve defined over k, which has totally degenerate reduction. Now, that means that it has a model over the, res over the ring, the valuation ring, where the special fiber it consists only of genus zero components that meet in double points. Then you can reverse the process and recover this uh, v, this algebraic curve v, as the quotient of the upper half plane by the action of a discrete group. The thing is, it's not always the upper half plane that we've been talking about. The space that you use to uniformize actually depends a little bit on the structure of the curve. But I won't uh, get into that in detail. Um, here's a, some examples. So the Tate curve, this has totally degenerate reduction because reduce it mod p, and it's a rational curve with meeting maybe itself or other rational curves with double points. The curves x naught of p have this property at p. You know, they have this two rational curve model. So they actually have a piatic uniformization, but in a very non-explicit way. So that you have to, it's not quite the regular upper half plane, and the groups are unknown. I mean, the groups are kind of random, but they, it exists in some way. And if you take this curve, y squared equals x to the eighth plus 14x to the fourth plus 1, this one is actually um, explicitly uniformized by the piatic upper half plane and by a particular group that comes from quaternions. I think I have a picture of it. So here it is. See, if you reduce this equation mod 3, it it's splits as x to the fourth plus 1 squared. So mod 3, this curve, has these two components corresponding to the two square roots of this thing, meeting at ordinary double points. And, and this, um, so this thing turns out to be uniformized by the piatic upper half plane. And you can draw this intersection graph where you make a dot for each component, and you connect the components by edges when corresponding to the places where they meet. And this, uh, I've indicated a harmonic function on there. That's because it has one flowing into this edge and one flowing out. And this intersection graph turns out to be, I mean, if this curve is the quotient of the piatic upper half plane by the action of the discrete group, then the graph turns out to be the quotient of the tree by the action of the discrete group. So. Uh, that's a kind of a taste of what a totally split curve looks like. Now, the um, most important case somehow from the number theoretic point of view, or one of the most important cases, is there's a whole class of modular curves called Shimura curves, which have this kind of uniformization by the piatic upper half plane. So what is a Shimura curve? I mean, I, this is a little bit of a detour. I won't say much about it. But there are modular curves which classify abelian surfaces, so two-dimensional abelian varieties that are principally polarized, and where you fixed an indefinite quaternion algebra over Q, let's say, for simplicity, which acts on this abelian surface by, that's part of the data, is the action of this quaternion algebra. And maybe you also pick some level structure. So classically, you can construct these by taking a maximal order in B, and taking its units of norm 1. And that turns out to be, I mean, you can, because this is indefinite, that basically means that B star, the units, embed into GL2 of R. And the, they, the units are then a discrete arithmetic subgroup in GL2 R, SL2 R, if you take the units of norm 1. And the quotient is one of these algebraic curves, called a, uh, one of these modular curves called a Shimura curve. So they, um, they're, in some ways, easier than the modular curves because the groups are co-compact, but in other ways, harder. I mean, there's no cusp, so you don't have Q expansions and so forth to work with modular forms. And there's a theorem due to Cherednik and Drinfeld which says that if you start with a 
classical Shimura curve that's uniformized by the units in an indefinite quaternion algebra of discriminant n. So to be an indefinite algebra means, first of all, that when you tensor with R, you get the two by two matrices over R, but in, that forces the discriminant, these are the primes where you locally, the algebra is a division algebra, have to be an even number of them. So pick one of them and, and, inf and move it to, and just delete it from n. And now you have an odd number of primes, and there's a quaternion algebra which is definite and has that division algebra. So the, the new one, the new quaternion algebra, embeds into the two by two matrices over QP for the P that you threw away. And you take a maximal order in that definite quaternion algebra, and you take the elements that's, whose norm is a power of P. And by playing this game, which is called interchange of invariance, you get a piadic discrete group. And the quotient of the piadic upper half plane by that piadic discrete group is the same curve as the quotient of the classical upper half plane by the other discrete group. This is a very deep theorem due to Cherednik and Drinfeld, but um, it gives us a lot of examples of curves interesting to number theorists which have explicit piadic uniformization. So just to review what I just said, you start with a definite quaternion algebra of discriminant n, and so now n is a square free integer with an odd number of prime divisors. You pick a prime which doesn't divide it. This is not the same n as on the previous slide. I've thrown out the p already. Pick a prime which doesn't divide n. Embed b tensor qp into the two by two matrices over qp. Take a maximal order in b where p is inverted. Or put another way, you sort of take elements whose norm is a power of p. If you take the units of that, these are like the integral quaternions whose norm is a power of p. And that's a discrete group. And then you can impose some additional level structure, like you could say things, quaternions congruent to one. And that gives you a discrete group. And the, those groups gamma of m give you groups that act discontinuously on the tree x. And if you take large enough m, you get a free action. And the quotient of the, gra of the tree by that group will then be a finite graph, no cusps, no, nothing hanging off it, just a, a, a finite graph. And if you take the quotient of the upper half plane by that group, you actually get an algebraic curve. I've called it Sn of m here, which is a Shimura curve that classifies abelian surfaces that have this endomorphism structure corresponding to the indefinite algebra where you have to put p back into the level. And I guess maybe the punchline here is this Sn of m is totally degenerate over qp. And its component graph is the quotient of the tree by this discrete group. So the example that I drew in the, and the genus, maybe I'll just mention that, is the genus of the graph. So that example that I drew earlier in the picture was obtained by taking a particular such group. I took the Hamilton quaternions, and I took the elements of norm three, powers of three. And uh, you take the quotient of the tree by the action of this group, and you get that graph that I drew, which has the two dots and the three, four lines joining it. And the reason you can figure out that that's the correct curve is you get a curve of which has so many automorphisms because of the units in this quaternion algebra that there, there's only one possibility. So it's a bit of a cheat. But um, this is related to the project that our people are working on uh, in my group, but for the quaternion algebra of discriminant 10. Is the genus of the graph just the rank of H1? Yeah, the genus of the graph is just the number of cycles in the graph. So in that picture you saw there, there were four edges, so the genus was three. Now in this situation where you have a discrete group acting, and maybe I, I mean I could say the, the, the fact, in, in a certain sense, this uniformization result is not that hard. I mean, the group acts discontinuously on the piatic upper half plane, which means it moves these affinoid domains around kind of combinatorially. It takes one of these affinoid domains and just moves it to another one. So the gluing process is done in the rigid topology. And the curve that you get looks locally like P1. And that's very unusual. I mean, a typical algebraic curve of good reduction doesn't look locally like P1 in the rigid topology, but these split curves do. So um, now I mentioned that if you want to prove that you have a piatic uniformization, what you want to do is construct modular forms. So what's a modular form? Well, it's just the, the gamma of m invariant sections of Ox of k. Right, because to be, if you remember what the k action meant, to be invariant by the action of this gamma is just an equation like this. 
So the, you take the invariance by this discrete group, and you're looking for modular forms for that discrete group. You can think of this as a global, I mean, it's coming from a uh, particular line bundle, the tensor product of the, of the one forms. So that, that allows you to give an algebraic meaning to these invariant uh, objects. If you believe the Gaga theorem, these things here, this, this space consists of algebraic things because it's sections of the line bundle that you would get after you take the quotient. But now we want to sort of combine these pictures. We have on the one hand this modular form picture, and on the other hand all this analytic machinery. So what do we get out of that? Well, we have the residue map, which takes us from uh, rigid functions to harmonic co-cycles. But that residue map is equivariant for the group. So if we impose a discrete group condition, then the result is an invariant harmonic function. All right, there we go. So in the case where k is 2, just to sort of make this somewhat more concrete. Think back to my picture, uh, if you want, the picture of the two lines and then that little graph which had the, the edges in it. So the x mod gamma graph has finitely many edges. And remember, these harmonic functions, let's take k equals 2. So the harmonic functions, that's just a, a gamma invariant harmonic function on the tree. So you can think of that as labeling the edges of the quotient graph in such a way that the net inflow and outflow of the vertices is 0. And I showed one of those on the picture, you remember. And such a thing should be able to be, is automatically bounded, first of all, because its values on the whole tree are just translates of its values on the finitely many initial edges. And by my integration result, um, well, first of all, the dimension of the space of harmonic cycles is just the genus of the graph. That's easy to see. In my example, there were three harmonic functions, linearly independent ones. But by the integration theory, you can integrate it back to get a modular form of weight 2. And the residue map is an inverse to this construction. So we have actually an isomorphism between these two spaces. And if you think about the dimensions, this thing, these are the invariant one forms on the quotient graph. So that's the genus, the algebraic genus of the curve. And this thing whoops, is the genus of the graph. Okay, so. The genus of the graph and the genus of the curve are not only the same, but there's actually a map from the first homology of the graph into the uh, holomorphic one forms on the, on the uh, uniformized curve. I'm going to skip this discussion of HECA operators because there isn't really much time and just make the following remark. You can make HECA operators in this picture, uh, and if you do that, you can, the HECA operators actually act on the invariant harmonic cocycles. And if you, and what you end up with is what's called classically the theory of Brandt matrices. And the eigenvalues of the Brandt matrices turn out to be related to modular forms on SL2Z, the ones we're more familiar with. Maybe you know this, if you've ever computed spaces of mo uh, eigenvalues of modular forms by looking at the action on supersingular J invariants, you end up doing a lot of quaternion algebra calculations. Similar phenomenon. So from the point of view of modular forms, the things which turn up for, as far as eigenvalues of the Hecke algebra in this quaternionic comp calculation are included in the things that turn up in classical modular forms. This, the terminology is you can find a modular form as a system. I mean, one of my rigid analytic modular forms somehow corresponds to a classical modular form when that classical modular form is lifted from a quaternion algebra by the Jacques Langlands principle. So that's a somewhat restrictive condition. But a lot of, so x naught of 11, that one doesn't work. But uh, the modular, the elliptic curve of conductor 20, for example, 40, works. So the, um, the other part of the project that, that people are working on is to do some calculations with these, um, these modular forms and to sort of try to find the connection between these Hecke eigenvalues on this finite graph and recognizable modular forms that you can, for instance, find in Cremona's tables. Um, the uh, next part of these lectures is to 
try to make the, as I said at the beginning, I mean, there's sort of two parts to this whole thing. The first part was about the geometry, and this is more or less the end of the part about the geometry. And the second part is to try to connect this back to questions more in number theory related to piatic L functions and so forth. And the, um, the unifying theme in that part is, um, is this notion of L invariant. So uh, I think now we have a bit of a, I mean, you have to keep all this picture in mind, but sort of file it away for a little while. And now we sort of take a little digression into still piatic analysis, but, but a little bit different kind, because the uh, piatic upper half plane will fade away for a little while. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about where L invariants came from. And one of the reasons, basically, I got interested in piatic uniform That was part of the problem. There were, there were many problems. Well, we have the technician in the back of the room. Uh, you know, you spend all this time developing the ability to project in a big room, and then you become a dinosaur because technology renders this skill not only an advantage but a positive disadvantage. Okay, so anyway, I was. I mean, I got interested in piatic uniformization because of L invariants. Okay, so this is the strat. The, basically, I think with luck, I have two lectures today, and with luck, I'll be at the end of these four topics uh, by the end of my second lecture. Uh, so I'll talk about L invariants, and then a little bit about this particular L invariant that you can construct using the theory that we've described. And then I'm going to move on into these new ideas, which are due to Henri Darmon, which blend the sort of theory of the piatic upper half plane with the theory of the classical upper half plane in a really, I think, spectacularly beautiful way, uh, and leading then to this particular example of an L invariant due to Darmon and Orton. And uh, then the last lecture on whatever day it is will be about work of Broglie. So some background on L invariants. So the, they start, we start with a piatic L function. So now we're in the classical situation. We have a modular form, a, a regular one, an honest one, uh, of even weight k, let's say, and some level n prime. And we want to find a piatic L function which interpolates the algebraic part of this, uh, of the classical L function of this modular form. And the, basically, the variable here, chi, we're allowed to twist this by a quadratic character. And we're interested in this whole situation, in the particular case where our modular form has level n prime, and p divides that level one time. And in that case, the p Fourier coefficient of the modular form is p to the k minus 2 over 2 times a sine. At least, let's assume that. Uh, uh, and the, so this sign here is related to the sign of the functional equation. And what happens is that the, um, the sign of the piatic functional equation turns out to be the opposite of the sign of the classical functional equation, and the conjecture of Birch and Swinnerton Dyer is thrown off by one. Namely, the, I mean, presumably, at least one. The uh, piatic L function vanishes even though the algebraic one doesn't. So, um, The, I mean, I want to describe now what I meant by the algebraic part of the L function. So to do that, I need to talk a little bit about 
So here, I'm back, this is my situation. I have my classical new form. The modular symbols, just something is messed up here. I seem to have lost a whole bunch of slides. Okay, I'm just out of order. I apologize. I'm a little confused here. It's a little bit out of order, but. Um, the way you express the special values of the classical L function is by integrating in the upper half plane from, let's say, zero to infinity. And uh, so one of the pieces of equipment that you use to define this p-adic L function and also to compute the algebraic part of the classical L function are the modular symbols. And the modular symbols are these integrals from, let's say, R to infinity of your modular form times a polynomial of degree k minus 2. And this is some normalization. Basically, if you like, the plus or minus, more, morally speaking, are the real and imaginary parts of these numbers. I copied this out of Broy, and for some reason, he likes to reverse the real and imaginary parts. But um, these collection of complex numbers, it turns out, even though you have a lot of these R's that you can plug in, and they seem like there might be quite a lot of complex numbers, actually belong to a two-dimensional lattice uh, generated by these complex numbers, the complex periods of the modular form, and integral over the ring where the L function takes the Hilke eigenvalues of the L function lie. So we're mostly going to be interested in the case where F comes from, has rational eigenvalues. So this is just a two-dimensional Z lattice in the complex numbers that are gotten as the periods of this modular form. And the other thing we're going to need is the space of modular, form, uh, of modular symbols for f. So I've written it here in a kind of fancy way. Maybe the best thing to do for the moment is think about k equals 2. If k is 2, this is just that field, e. And the modular symbol for f is a function. You plug in two endpoints. You plug in a path in the upper half plane that goes from the rational number r over to the rational number s. And you compute these periods. Uh, you integrate from s to infinity minus the integral from r to infinity. And remember, the plus or minus just means, depending on which sign you pick, you only care about the real part or the imaginary part of this number that you get. So here's a picture, right? There you go from s to r in the upper half plane, the regular old complex upper half plane. So uh, this modular symbol has a bunch of properties, of which the most important ones, I think, are that it, gamma naught of m now is the, the group that m is f, the function is modular for, and it, you get uh, a, an equivariance property. I mean, if you uh, use the modular property of f, you find that this is a gamma naught of m invariant map. The Hecke algebra acts on this. This is the usual Hecke algebra, the one that acts on the form f, no quaternions. And if you sort of pick out from here the subspace where the um, modular form where the eigenvalues of the Hecke operator agree with those on f, you find the two-dimensional space. So what that's saying really is that if you just took out, just did this, looked at this thing, this is an algebraic thing, there's no f, and then look in there for where the Hecke algebra acts the way it acts on f, you actually find the space, a two-dimensional space that in the other sense you would have had to find by integrating. And this thing is the uh, complex conjugation. So it, 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 if it acts on the plus or minus, I mean, if you figure out how it acts on, here it acts by Mobius transformations, and here it just acts on the polynomial by changing the variable by some CZ plus Ds and so forth. It acts like complex conjugation. So these are the raw, this is the raw material for working out the values of the L function. So, and just for a piece of terminology here, this, this is what I mean by the twist of the L function. You, you, change the coefficients of f by this Dirichlet character that gives you another L function of, of higher level, depending on the conductor of the character. OK, so this is why I did all of this. This nonsense here is called the algebraic part of the special value of the L function. And um, you pick the, 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 the sign that you pick here depends, this is the sign, depends on the sign of the functional equation turns out to be an algebraic number. And you can calculate it by modular symbols. This formula here, these are these things, this is this modular symbol. These are integrals in the upper half plane, right? And uh, probably I should have divided by the period. I always am confused about whether the period is included in the modular symbol or not. But anyway, this is an integral with, this is a particular polynomial. You sum it over some character values, and probably then you should 
divide out by this period to get this thing. The important thing is, knowing this number, you basically know this classical L function. Now, at the same time, you can make a piatic L function. And the way you do that is you take these modular symbols again, and you organize them into a distribution. So it's constructed from a distribution on locally analytic functions on this space ZP, where you've taken, you've got a little bit of tame part. Z, you took the projective limit here, but C just gives you a little bit of finite extra stuff. And uh, you get the, uh, the distribution is characterized on open sets through these values of the modular symbols. And you define the piatic L function by integrating against this distribution these character values. And if you do this, and you do this explicitly, what you find is that um, in the case where the piatic L function vanishes to one higher order than it ought to by the Birch Swinerton Dyer conjecture, if you compare the algebraic value and the analytic piatic analytic value, you now you have to take the derivative here because your, your order of vanishing is off by one. And you find this seems to be this number L of f, which doesn't depend on chi. In other words, the, the presumption is somehow that this number L of f, which relates the algebraic and the classical piatic, the algebraic value of the L function and the piatic L function, is some local invariant of the Galois representation associated to the modular form f. And this is one construction of a number called the L invariant of f, a conjectural construction, at least you know, when we first did this. And um, then you might ask, you know, well, what is this number? <laughs> so if k is 2 and f is a modular form associated to an elliptic curve, and you're in the case where e has multiplicative reduction at p, then you have a take curve. And numerically, it seemed that this number L of f is the log of the take period divided by its valuation. So this is an isogeny invariant of that elliptic curve, which is good because the, the relation between L functions is an isogeny invariant. And um, this theorem was proved, namely that this relation holds with that log q over ord q as the missing number by Greenberg and Stevens as an application of HEDA theory. So that's the weight 2 case. And if you unwrap this, it turns out to be this kind of amazing relation where you do this infinite sum of logs and integrals on the upper half plane, and you compare it to some other horrible thing involving sums of integrals over the upper half plane, and you, piatic limit is the log of the Tate curve. So somehow the integrals on the upper half plane know about the piatic period of the elliptic curve. Now, what about in higher weight? Oops. In higher weight, you go back to this thing here. And then you might say, well, OK, I believe that there should be a number that goes here, which is a local invariant of f. There's no log q anymore because you don't, I mean, you have a higher weight modular form, so there's no elliptic curve associated to it. So you could just say, OK, well, I think there's a number that belongs here that is a local invariant of the form, and it relates these two things. And that's the theorem that was proved by Orton using ideas, I mean, Darmon using ideas of Darmon. In, in other words, she proved literally that statement, that those two things are related by a number which seems to be invariant, doesn't depend on the character. And the interesting thing, so she, in this sense, in, gave a construction of a number, the Orton L invariant, which satisfied that conjecture. That's only a small part of the story. That's what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon. But it's only a small part of the, of the story, because lots of other people uh, took a stab at defining this number. And this is a list of some of them. So LT, that, that was me. Mine, my idea was to use this whole uniformization theory that we talked about. Coleman used a slightly different idea, also involving piatic integration, but on classical modular curves. Fontaine and Maser used Fontaine's theory of uh, piatic Galois representations to construct a number. Darmon and Orton, as I've mentioned, they used this uh, kind of ideas of Darmon to construct a number. And Broy recently came up with yet another number all these different constructions of possible numbers which could fit into that equation relating the algebraic and the piatic special value of the L function. 
And they're all now known to be equal. Okay? And, and I attempted, I thought it would be very nice in this, in my notes, to say, you know, who proved which and in what order. But I, it's, a, it's a directed graph of a considerable complexity at this point. So I kind of abandoned that. Um, and not only that, that, that the fact, not only that these numbers are equal, but that they all fit into this conjecture is also now known. And basically, all of these same people, plus a few more, uh, were involved in, in that. So one way to prove all the numbers are equal is by proving that they all satisfy the equation relating the L function values. So let me, I, I think I have like six or seven minutes. So let me just briefly indicate how you use the theory of p-adic integration to construct one of these L invariants. Now it's not, it, it's, it's a flawed one because it's not completely general. And um, it only works somehow for um, a particular class of modular forms that come from Shimura curves, but at least for those, it works. I may not get through all of this, but I'll at least start, and then I'll finish it this afternoon. So I'm going to go back to my p-adic uniformization of Shimura curves picture. Namely, I have a definite quaternion algebra of discriminant n, and I have this prime, and I have a level structure m, which is not related to any of the primes that have come up so far and a maximal z1 over p order, and the units in that congruent to 1 mod m. And now I'm going to take a modular form of weight k for that quaternion algebra group. And so here it is. It belongs to this space O of k gamma of m. And as, as I mentioned, the Hecke op algebra for the quaternion algebra acts on these things. It's a similar double coset construction to the way you do HECA operators in the SL2Z case, and I'm going to take my f to be an eigenfunction for this HECA algebra. And by this Jacquet Langlands principle that I mentioned before, the, this f, the eigenvalues that you get out of this f, correspond to some specific modular form on SL2Z of weight k and some level that you would have to calculate related to all these primes and levels that are coming up here. So I mean, if you wanted to really do the, the work on the conjecture it was, as it was originally formulated, you would start with a modular form on SL2z. And then you'd have to figure out, find a quaternion algebra, and find a modular form for that quaternion algebra, which corresponds to your uh, form on SL2z. And you can't always do that, but lots of times you can. So this will only work in the situation where you can do that. Now, by the integration theory that we developed, this modular form is a distribution on this space of locally analytic functions. Right? That somehow is the Morita result. And that's what we want to use to get an L invariant. Oops. So we're going to do this by integration. And I'm going to make two functions on the uh, in the following way. I mean, this is sort of formal here. I'm going to tell you what this means in a minute. But it, this, the they're, they're two functions are similar. You plug, you plug in a gamma, okay, and you plug in a polynomial of degree k minus 2, and you do the following double integral. So the inner integral here, this is, so lambda f, remember, this is the distribution that corresponds to f. So Integrating this distribution, integrating 1 over z minus x against this distribution just reconstructs f. And now what do I mean by the integral from z to gamma of z of f dz? Well, maybe it's not so clear, but basically what I mean is, if you want to think of it this way, f is a function on the upper half plane, so just restrict it to a big, annual, a big affinoid domain that contains both z and gamma z. Write it as some kind of power series and just integrate it formally. And uh, since you're taking a definite integral here, the constant of integration will go out. And for our purposes, that's a good enough kind of integration to do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there should be, I should have multiplied this by p of z. Sorry. OK? Stick p of z in there. Or take k equals 2, and then there's no p of x. And on the, the second integral here, 
is on the tree. So I, again, I have this gamma, which is in my discrete group. And I just, instead of integrating anything, I sum from a vertex v picked at random to its gamma translate the value of the residue of the function f evaluated on the polynomial p of x. So remember, the residue at a given edge is a linear form on this space of polynomials. So this gives me a number. These two functions here turn out to be um, one co-cycles for the group gamma with values in the hom on the polynomials, right? So in other words, if you restrict, if you think of this as a, it's a function of two variables, but if you evaluate it at gamma and then think of it as a function of the polynomial variable, it satisfies the co-cycle relation as, with respect to that polynomial. So you get two one co-cycles here. This is a finite dimensional space, finite dimensional vector space. You have this group acting on it. And you have two co-cycles. And the Hecke algebra acts on everything in sight here. And the space where you have the eigenvalues corresponding to f turns out to be one dimensional. And it's a theorem of Schneider and de Chalit that the first one of these, the, the hf ord, is actually an isomorphism. So we have two maps from here to here. And these spaces are of dimension equal to the genus of the corresponding modular curve. But if you impose the Hecke action, the Hecke action picks out one-dimensional spaces on both sides corresponding to f. Actually, one-dimensional space here, I guess. And, uh, and one of the maps is an isomorphism. And so if you have two maps, and one of them is an isomorphism, and they're between one-dimensional vector spaces, then they differ by a scalar. And so the LT invariant is just the thing you have to multiply this function by to get that one in this one-dimensional space. And that's called the LT invariant. And uh, the miraculous thing about it, I mean, a lot of things are, one miraculous thing about it is, I mean, it seems to work. You calculate, it's calculatable. And if you do numerical calculations, it seems to work. Of course, it's now, I guess, a theorem of Darmon and Iavita and Bertolini and is that all? I think that that particular combination of that list of names that I listed, that this is equal, this invariant is actually equal to other invariants that were known to be equal to the correct L invariant. So, um, uh, so I think I'm going to stop. And I should mention that for those of you in the group who are supposed to be calculating this, in the weight 2 case, what do you get? Well, what you end up getting is the this, notice there's an integral that involves, that I, why did I call this hf log? Well, interchange the order of integration and integrate out the z variable. Never mind if that's legal or not. You get log of z minus x. So this, this one sort of involves the logarithm, and this one involves the piatic or. So there's two maps. And it turns out that you have this uniformized curve, and you've picked out this elliptic curve. And so the Shimura curve uniformizes an elliptic curve that you're interested in. And if you choose the parameters correctly by taking the Hecke action into account and compute this number, it turns out to be the log of q over the order of q of that elliptic curve. So these p adic integrals in the way 2 case actually do agree with what they're supposed to in the classical way 2 case, if you like. And I guess I'm a little over time. So I'll stop here and pick up this afternoon.